Have you ever had the paranoid feeling that you're being watched? Maybe during some unusually quiet hours in your home or on a busy street in the afternoon. Now, imagine that someone is watching you, observing your every move, scribbling notes in their little notebook every time you move. If you're feeling creeped out, you might be able to put yourself in the shoes of some ballerinas who spent entire days with an unmarried, middle-aged man in the corner staring at them. That man was none other than the famous impressionist painter, Edgar Degas. But here's a little twist. Degas was the least of their worries. Most Parisian ballerinas in the 19th century were going through much worse at the hands of the wealthy Parisian males who patiently waited for them backstage. The girl is the only person in the room who exudes a sliver of grace that we're used to seeing on a ballet stage. The old man to the right, who is cosplaying Mr. Miyagi from Karate Kid and watching the girl intently, represents the legendary ballet master, Jules Perrault. Moving from left to right, we can sense a narrative. We start with the girls who are getting ready for the exam, the middle girl who is giving her exam, and the group of girls in the back who finished. If we go further back, we see some ladies looking on. Now, there is a lack of adherence to the compositional and technical traditions of the time. But the truly interesting story lies beyond the canvas. It lies in the hidden secrets of the subjects we see before our very eyes. But it wouldn't be fun to spoil the surprise right away. So let's rewind a bit. This is Hilaire Germain Edgar Degas. That is his full name, yes. Born in 1834 to a wealthy family in Paris, he started painting quite early. Right after school, he registered as a copyist in the Louvre. In 1855, he enrolled at the École des Beaux Arts, and the following year, he was on his way to Italy, where he copied works of the old masters like Michelangelo, Raphael, and Titian. In 1859, he was back in Paris and announced his return with a bang. He started to paint historical pieces inspired by the works of Eugène Delacroix alongside his studies of horses and domestic scenes. Over the next six years, all he did was paint. While he produced many paintings, none of these involved the ballerinas we know him for today. But in these paintings, he was starting to utilize vibrant colors in a very restricted manner. Still, things were not working out for him for two reasons. One, he'd met the man, the myth, the legend, Edouard Manet, in 1863, who changed his outlook on painting. Manet was like your insightful friend who thinks every mainstream film is boring. You hate his high and mighty takes, but also know that he's kind of right. He's already created a ton of controversy with a couple of his paintings and was now leading others astray. The two affected each other's views on art and developed a love-hate relationship. Manet would later say that Degas had no interest in women. Degas claimed that Manet was essentially spoiled. It got ugly. Two. In 1865, one of his paintings was accepted at the salon and mildly praised. For those that don't know, mildly praise is French slang for didn't sell. The salon liked historical paintings a lot and was the arbiter of artistic merit in the Parisian society. So he continued to submit works over the next five years. After continued frustration, he grew increasingly hostile to the people around him and suddenly he lost interest in historical painting. Over the next decade, a big change occurred. Degas began painting portraits. Near the end of the decade, he started receiving interest from dealers and the public. Wars in Europe were common. So when another one broke out in 1870, Degas enlisted and realized that his eyesight was a little weak. This affected his journey forward, but so did another event. After painting a portrait of a friend who was a bassoon player, he became obsessed with theater and ballet. And this is when he painted a series of pictures depicting ballet dancers. The first few he painted sold like hotcakes. So he followed the money. This is where we see the famous dance class in 1874. During this period, his father had just passed away and he had to sell his house to pay his brother's debts. What this led to, however, was a sense of desperation as he had to fend for himself. Hence, following the money became the only option. But another aspect was the direction of arts at the time. 
Since de Gaulle wanted to be taken more seriously, he began putting more thought into his work and decided to join a group of ragtag artists that we now refer to as Impressionists. Although, like some of his contemporaries, he rejected the title, opting instead to call himself a realist. The term realism came from artists like Manet, who unbashedly depicted the truth of Parisian life without resorting to cheap sentiment. All these considerations make ballet and opera interesting subjects. Opera is pretty much an older version of overtly sappy TV soap operas. In this case, the devil is not in the details. It's just right there in the name. Ballet, on the other hand, is a different story. It has an interesting facade of grace and sophistication. But in the 19th century, the truth was far from it. And as we make our way through the frame of this painting, we start to get at the truth. For starters, the unshapely, ungainly manner in which the dancers pose contradicts what we assume comes naturally to traditional ballet dancers. Let's look at the girl in the front, since she sets the tone for the rest of the painting. Another girl behind her, who we can barely make out, adjusts her waist and drags her tutu forward in the process. The girl in the front poses bizarrely, as if not observed, and the girl behind her does not seem like the subject of a 19th century painting. So, no discernible pose, no weight, and almost no appearance. The tutu she is arranging might even end up tumbling the music stand. To be fair, no one can really understand that written notation, so no big deal. Anyway, if you look closely, you realize that there's another figure hiding behind her, just as she hides behind another. And out of those mostly incognito heads rises another girl, like a Medusa or a Hydra, whichever one makes more sense to you. She bites her nails in anticipation. In the leftmost corner, another disheveled girl is looking into what seems like a mirror. There is another mirror in the middle of the composition. This one is large and opens the space by introducing us to a window, the source of light. There is also a poster right beside the mirror for Rosine's Guillaume Tell, in which Jean-Baptiste Faure played the starring role. Faure was also the commissioner for this piece, so this poster is most likely a tribute to him. Observers at the Salon revered historical works because they had a clear-cut narrative. There is a narrative here, but it's much rougher around the edges. The image has a very unchoreographed vibe, not to mention the loose brush strokes, but seek and you shall find. The composition is deceptively creative. The lines at the top lead us to the room's corner in the back. The open space on the right side of the frame gives the viewer a place to step into the frame. Then, the lines meeting in the corner and the swirling empty space through the middle lead the eyes across the entire room. However, the salon did not appreciate these tricks as much as we do. They were also not fans of the loose strokes and the realism of the scene. So, Degas exhibited it at the Salon des Refuse, which was an exhibition set up for the rejected, degenerate art of Courbet, Pissarro, Manet, and the like. While the form was radical, the true radicalism of the picture lay in the context. The ballerinas that we see here are mostly lower class. Ballet was waning in popularity at the time, and the performers had to engage in toxic social contracts that involved liaisons with wealthy gentlemen. Since these patrons were the last lifeline of most operas, they got away with murder, metaphorically speaking. Now you might think that this must have been restricted to a few establishments, but no. This was happening across town. So much so that the Grand Opera House, Palais Garnier, was designed so that its stage led to Foyer de la Danse in the back where male subscribers socialized with the girls. The ballerinas that were in the training phase had to put in grueling six-day weeks to make ends meet. The work included both engaging audiences on the stage and shady patrons backstage. To rub salt into the wound, they were called petite rats, a reference to their perceived impiety. If you think the story behind the painting is depressing, here's a surprise. The story of the artist's life is even more depressing. Degas painted a twin painting with this one around the same time called the ballet class. Showing the face behind the mask and the ugliness behind the glamour remained a staple of his work over the years. With the exception of Jules Perrault in this painting, some of the male spectators in his other works make you wonder, what were they doing there? Is there a disturbing side to this? Perhaps the men might have been Degas' focus in the first place. 
In the late 70s and early 80s, Degas turned to sculpture as his eyesight worsened. His sculpture, Little Dancer Aged 14, was exhibited and its awkward pose and uniqueness gave people something to talk about. As the camera started gaining popularity, the artist turned to the new tool. But in the final years of his life, he'd gone completely blind. He restlessly wandered the streets of Paris until his death in 1917. What do you think of Degas' ballerinas? Let us know in the comments. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button for, and subscribe for more content. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.